the death occurred under circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to human life. When asked for clarification on what he means by gone, he said that he is dead. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. As I say in so many of my cases, and I will continue to say until the day I die, every single child deserves a kind, loving family who will take care of them and at the absolute minimum, meet their basic needs. In most cases, we see parents who start out trying their best to take care of their baby. They feed them, provide for them, and make sure they have a safe place to rest their head at night. But when the child grows older, that is when the abusive and neglectful behaviors start emerging. However, in this case, this little baby never even got a chance. From the moment he was born, his parents decided that he wasn't worthy of their time or attention. And let me tell you, it's just absolutely heartbreaking. This is the case of Sterling Cohen. Sterling Cohen was born on May 1st, 2017 to Cheyenne Harris and Zachary Cohen in Alta Vista, Iowa. I wish I could tell you about little Sterling and his life, but he didn't even get a chance. He was just short of four months old when he died. He was just a tiny baby with a brain working hard to develop and grow by taking in all sorts of new experiences and stimulus around him. By the age of four months old, babies are starting to recognize familiar people and objects around them. They start showing love and affection towards those who care for them. They're starting to smile and imitate facial expressions from others. They show excitement when they're happy and they enjoy interacting with others. That is where Sterling was at in his developmental timeline. To understand what happened in this case though, let's start by discussing Sterling's parents. Zach Cohen was born in Clarksville, Mississippi. Zach and his three siblings were raised in a very strict Mennonite household. Now, I wasn't too familiar with what Mennonite was, so I did some light research. Mennonites are an anti-Baptist Christian demonstration which believe in simple living but express that simplicity through worship and community. They're very similar to the Amish community, but Mennonites don't isolate themselves from the rest of society like the Amish do, and their practices aren't quite as strict as the Amish. Though, from what I can tell, Mennonites are pretty strict in their lifestyle. However, by the time Zach was in his teens, he started drinking alcohol and smoking weed, which is strictly forbidden in the Mennonite community, so he was excommunicated at the age of 16. By the time he was 17, he started working as a truck driver. This meant that Zach was working very long hours. So, it was around this time that Zach also started using meth so he could stay awake. Soon after starting this job, Zach met a woman named Sherry. The two would go on to have a son together, but they didn't seem to have the healthiest relationship and neither parent was fit to care for their son. So, Zach's parents ultimately gained custody of the boy. We don't know too much more details about this other than what I just told you. We don't know exactly what was going on. We don't know exactly why they gained custody of their son. My assumption is it had something to do with Zach's drug use and maybe even the mother's drug use, but that's just my opinion. We don't know for sure. After that, sometime in 2014, 25-year-old Zach met 17-year-old Cheyenne Harris and the two started dating, which again, not a great look for Zach at this point. A year later, on November 15th, 2016, Cheyenne gave birth to her first child, a daughter named Nala. At the time, the couple had been living in Riceville, Tennessee, which is where Cheyenne's family is from. But sometime after having Nala, the couple decided to move back to Zach's hometown in Alta Vista, Iowa. During all of this, Cheyenne also started to use meth. According to Zach, she was the one who originally asked him for it since he was already using it. But once she started, she quickly became addicted. And with any drug addiction like this, especially with meth, when she wasn't using, she was very irritable and difficult to be around. By mid to late 2016, Cheyenne found herself pregnant once again, this time with a baby boy. However, during her pregnancy, she did not stop her meth use. Sterling ended up being born two weeks early in a bathtub at Cheyenne's friend's house. By May 1st, 2017, Cheyenne and Zach were at a friend's house when she thought she was really constipated. 
So she went to the bathroom, but after trying to go, she realized that it was actually Sterling making his way into the world. Cheyenne screamed out to Zach from the bathroom, saying that Sterling was coming. So he helped her into the bathtub and ran some water where he helped deliver his son in a water birth. Once born, Zach called 911 to get Sterling to the hospital. Once there, doctors tested Sterling's blood, where it was confirmed that he had meth in his system. Now, after Sterling was born, Zach started to ponder if this baby was actually his. People apparently started asking Zach if Sterling was his because, according to Zach, his two other children have darker complexions and dark eyes like he does. Meanwhile, Sterling had much lighter skin and blue eyes, looking nothing like his siblings. When people would ask, Zach would say that he honestly didn't know if the boy was biologically his, but he didn't care. He was going to love and care for him regardless. However, whether Zach actually cared for Sterling is questionable, and that's a nice way of putting it. Now, after both Zach's daughter Nala and his son were born, Zach did not change a single diaper. Apparently, when Cheyenne was pregnant with Nala, Zach told her that he physically wasn't able to change diapers. If he saw or smelled poop, he would become sick and would vomit. He just did not have the stomach to change diapers, so this was Cheyenne's sole responsibility with both of their children. Not only was it her responsibility to get it done, but Zach wouldn't even check. So even if there was a dirty diaper, Zach never even knew about it, and even if the diaper only had pee in it, for example, he still wouldn't change it. Why? Well, according to Zach, he didn't have the chance to interact with Sterling very much at all. He worked very long hours being a truck driver. He worked the third shift, so he was typically working from 5 p.m. until 4 a.m., and most weeks, he said that he was working up to 70 to 80 hours per week. To keep up with this intense work schedule, he continued using math. Because of his substance abuse and long hours, he was exhausted all of the time. Anytime he was home and was awake, he wasn't ever allowed to hold Sterling because he was colicky. If Sterling was ever asleep, Cheyenne didn't want Zach to pick him up because he would just start crying again. So for most of Sterling's very short life, Zach was either not home, sleeping, or if he did see Sterling in his crib or swing, he would just look at him from across the room to avoid disturbing him as if he was some sort of museum exhibit. From my understanding, I don't think Zach held his son one time in his entire life. When Sterling was first born, Zach would help with feeding him. He would like basically just hold up the bottle while he was in the swing. But after a few months, Zach stopped feeding him. Once again, he said that this was because he was either never home or Sterling was asleep when he was home. So feeding him was Cheyenne's responsibility. However, by the time Sterling was around three months old, Zach said that he did become a bit concerned because Sterling didn't look like he was gaining weight. His daughter Nala got very chubby by that age, so the fact that Sterling wasn't chubby, it kind of concerned him. He apparently brought this concern to Cheyenne, who didn't seem concerned at all. Again, during this time, it seemed that Cheyenne was basically doing everything to take care of the baby while Zach was working hard, trying to provide for his family, and not really getting the chance to interact much with his son at all. But according to Zach, by around 3 a.m. on August 30th, 2017, he got home from work and started playing a game on his phone. While still up, his daughter came out and said that she was hungry, so he made her a little snack before she went back into her room. After that, at 6 a.m., Zach went to sleep. By around noon, Zach reports that he woke up to find Cheyenne standing at the foot of their bed, crying hysterically before she dropped to the ground. Zach was trying to figure out what happened, but Cheyenne was so hysterical that he had no idea what was going on at first. Eventually, she started saying, he's gone, he's gone. When Zach asked who was gone, Cheyenne said, Sterling. Zach then jumped out of bed and ran to the other bedroom where Sterling was in his swing. He immediately touched Sterling's forehead, which he said was cold. He saw that his skin looked blue and pale, and he had blood coming out of his mouth. 
By 12.55 p.m., Zach finally called 911 to report what happened. Zach would later say that it took almost an hour to call 911 because his cell provider, Verizon, had really bad service in Alta Vista. However, that would later be determined to be untrue because no matter what cell carrier someone has, if they call 911, it will automatically connect to the nearest tower regardless of what cell company runs that tower. So we don't know why it actually took so long to call, but it was stated that Zach was smoking while he was making this 911 call. So in my opinion, he probably spent some time smoking before making that call. In the call, he speaks in a relatively calm and collected manner. He tells the operator that he needs an ambulance because his son is gone. When asked for clarification on what he means by gone, he said that he is dead. He said that Cheyenne had fed the baby at around 9.30 a.m. that day, and at that time, he was just fine. But when they went to check on him at 11.30, he was dead. He said that he thought his son may have died from sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, which is basically just an unexplained infant death that doesn't really have any reason, and even after autopsy, there's no cause of death found. Minutes after the call, the first first responder arrived. When she got there, she saw a man, woman, and a young girl standing on the porch of the apartment. Now, I do want to note that this first responder was a volunteer, so she was just there by herself to sort of gather information about the initial scene while the rest of the first responders arrived. Now, this woman ran up and then told the man to show her where the baby was. At the time, she reported that neither Zach or Cheyenne showed any emotion when she asked to see the baby. They both just looked completely empty and blank. They also showed no urgency. It seemed like they didn't have a care in the world for what happened to their baby. The first responder had to urge Zach to take her inside of the house to go check on the baby and to show her where he was because obviously she can't just go in the house and figure out exactly where he is quick enough. It's much quicker if Zach shows her what's going on. So Zach then took her into the apartment where she followed him into a room near the back of the apartment unit. Upon entering the room, she noticed that it was dark, hot, and stuffy and smelled of urine. Once Zach turned the lights on, he actually left the room, leaving the first responder in the room alone with Sterling. In that room, there was no crib. There was no real baby furniture, no real toys, nothing. All she saw was Sterling in a swing all by himself, and the swing was facing a wall. So normally you'd walk into a room if a baby is in a swing, you'll see their face, you'll see them swinging, you'll actually see the swing. But with Sterling, the swing was turned facing a wall, so she could only see the back of the swing at first. When the first responder did her assessment, she found that Sterling was stiff and rigid. His entire body was cold to the touch. He wasn't breathing and didn't have a pulse. His clothes appeared dirty and crusty as if they hadn't been changed in a long time. At that time, the first responder knew that Sterling was beyond saving. There was absolutely nothing she could do. She couldn't perform CPR. She couldn't attempt any other measures to save his life. He was already gone. After the discovery of four-month-old Sterling's body, he was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy, and I want to warn you that what they found was absolutely horrific and is beyond understanding. The medical examiner found that Sterling was wearing both clothes and a diaper when he died. In the diaper, he found feces which appeared to have been there for quite some time. He determined this based on the color and consistency of the feces. It appeared almost sludge-like, which means that it was there for a long time. It was found at the scene that there were maggots all over the cloth of the swing. There were maggots all over Sterling's clothes and all within the feces of his diaper. The medical examiner worked with an expert in entomology, which is the study of insects, to explain how these maggots ended up on Sterling and everywhere around him. They would later explain that the maggots are the first life stage of a fly, so a fly hatchling. 
Flies are attracted to things like feces, urine, and bodily fluids, so they will lay their eggs in these types of environments. If left alone, the eggs will hatch and the maggots will infest the tissues in which they are hatched on. Now, it will typically take a day for a fly to find and reach a source of food. So if let's say you leave food out overnight and it starts to rot by the end of the following day, you are likely to find flies around it. And then if you leave that food even beyond that, you might find maggots in it a little bit after that. If you leave dog poop sitting on the floor of your home for more than a day, you are likely to find flies around it. And again, if it's left there for several more days after that, there might be maggots in it. Now, it was determined that the initial infestation most likely happened on August 20th or 21st. That means that by that point, Sterling had been sitting in his feces for a day. Then, based on how the life cycle of flies and maggots work, it would have taken 9 to 13 days after the eggs were laid for the maggots to have been born and were making their way into the different surfaces in which they were found. Based on this, it was determined that Sterling had been sitting in that swing in his own feces for 10 to 14 days before his body was found. Now, when performing the autopsy, the medical examiner is also going to look for other signs that could have contributed to his death. They found that because of how long Sterling had been sitting in those feces, his skin began to break down, allowing an E. coli infection to enter his body through his skin. Additionally, the ME found that Sterling was underweight, severely malnourished, and dehydrated at the time of his death. Based on all of these findings, the medical examiner determined that Sterling had died as a result of malnutrition, dehydration, and that E. coli infection, meaning that he was denied basic care from his parents for several days before his death. Therefore, his manner of death was determined to be homicide. As a result, both Zach Cohen and Cheyenne Harris were arrested and charged with first-degree murder and child endangerment resulting in death. Both pleaded not guilty and both went to trial for their charges. State of Iowa versus Zachary Paul King. Comes now Denise Timmons as prosecuting attorney and in the name and by the authority of the state of Iowa accuses Zachary Paul King of the crimes of murder in the first degree and child endangerment resulting in death. And the death occurred under circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to human life. It ended up being decided that they would be tried separately with Zach's trial starting in October of 2018 and Cheyenne's trial taking place in February of 2019. Although they were both tried separately though, both trials were very similar, so I'm going to be discussing both trials at the same time to avoid being redundant. Of course, anything that differs, I will make that clear. At both trials, the prosecution argued that Zach and Cheyenne neglected their baby to death. From the time Sterling was born, it was clear that neither Cheyenne or Zach cared for him. He was born with drugs in his system, and from what we heard earlier, Zach never changed a diaper, never fed him, and never even interacted with him. It was clear that when Sterling was left alone with Cheyenne, she also wasn't taking care of him. He wasn't being fed, changed, or interacted with. Now, according to friends of Zach's who worked with him, Zach would regularly talk about his daughter, Nala. In fact, he mentioned her almost daily. However, those same friends didn't even know he had a son. He never once mentioned him. Then, there was another friend who worked with Zach who testified that he had come to Zach's apartment to smoke meth with him and Cheyenne a few different times in July of 2017. Each time he would come over, all three of them would go in Zach and Cheyenne's bedroom and smoke there. While they smoked, Nala would be in the living room playing by herself. Meanwhile, the friend never even knew of Sterling's existence. Apparently, Cheyenne and Zach kept him in another bedroom with the door shut. Neither of them ever spoke of him, never brought him out, never even had the door open for the friends to see inside. They never went in the room to check on him. It was like he didn't even exist. Meanwhile, 
friends often saw Cheyenne and Zach take care of Nala. They saw Cheyenne cooking for Nala, playing with her, and just generally providing the care she needed. She appeared to be a healthy weight. She was clean and happy. Clearly, both Zach and Cheyenne knew how to care for a child. At Zach's trial, the prosecution said that Zach didn't care if Sterling died because he didn't care about him. He didn't want him as a son. It was argued that because he wasn't sure if Sterling was biologically his, he didn't care for him in the same way he cared for Nala. Now, his defense claimed that because it was Cheyenne's job to change and feed Sterling and because he was always working, he didn't notice that Sterling wasn't being changed or fed. He was a bit concerned that Sterling wasn't gaining weight like Nala did, but it wasn't to the point where he felt that Cheyenne had completely stopped feeding him. He had no idea that Sterling was being neglected by his mother. Zach even took the stand in his own defense, saying that he put his trust in Cheyenne to care for the baby. He put his trust in the wrong person who he thought would care for the baby. If he knew his son wasn't being cared for, he would have stepped in and fed him and changed him. Therefore, he bears no responsibility for his death. However, at the trial, the medical examiner testified about what we discussed earlier. Again, Sterling had been sitting in those feces for at least 10 years days. That is a ridiculous and disgusting amount of time for a baby to be stuck sitting in a soiled diaper. The ME testified that even after only one day of sitting in those feces, the smell would become very potent. The family lived in a very small apartment, like a tiny apartment. Their own bedroom wall shared a wall with the room that Sterling was in. As the days went on, the smell would have gotten worse and worse and would have gotten to the point that it was absolutely unbearable by the time little Sterling's skin started to break down and the infection was making its way in. There is no way Zach simply didn't notice the smell. Even if he didn't interact with him, even if he only looked at him from across the room, that entire apartment would have smelled absolutely disgusting. To add to that, as Sterling was starving to death, suffering from skin breakdown from an infection, he would have been in pain. He would have been crying out, waiting for somebody to take care of him. That is in a baby's nature. If they need something, if they're in pain, if they want their caregiver for any reason, they will cry. There's no way that Zach went all this time without hearing Sterling crying out in pain. And if Zach heard the baby crying and saw that Cheyenne was not responding when he was crying, that should have been an indicator to him that maybe Cheyenne is not taking care of the baby the way she's supposed to be. Then, even beyond that, even if Zach and Cheyenne agreed that she would take care of the diapers and the feedings, it's still Zach's responsibility to make sure those things are being done. He still needs to check with Cheyenne to see if she's actually doing it. He needs to take a look at his son and see if he's clean, if he's changed. If he's not, it's his responsibility to then ask Cheyenne to get the diaper changed per their agreement. But, as we heard from Zach's own friends, he never even acknowledged that he had a son. He never talked about him. When friends were over, Sterling was locked away in a room all by himself to the point that friends didn't even know Zach had a newborn until he was arrested for Sterling's death. And again, when people are smoking meth and doing drugs like that, chances are they're in that room for hours and throughout all of those hours, and who knows, it could have been all night, all throughout every single time that friend was over, they never checked on Sterling once. Even after his death, when the first responder arrived, Zach still didn't show any emotion and neither did Cheyenne. Despite Zach saying that he woke up to Cheyenne screaming and crying after finding Sterling dead, the first responder said that neither of them were upset or sad in the slightest. All of that shows that Zach didn't care about Sterling. He knew he was dying. He knew he wasn't being cared for and did nothing to step in. All the while, he took adequate care of his two-year-old daughter. He would check on her, make sure she was fed, make sure she was clean. She even got to be out and meet his friends who would come over and do meth. 
This showed that Zach knew perfectly well how to take care of a child. He just didn't want to take care of Sterling. At Cheyenne's trial, her defense claimed that although Sterling's death is tragic, it was not an intentional homicide. Rather, it was because of Cheyenne's own mental health issues. They argued that Cheyenne dealt with postpartum depression, which she was using meth to self-medicate. Her mental health led to her not being able to provide the proper care to her baby. At the trial, the defense brought forward a doctor who diagnosed Cheyenne as suffering with major depression, PTSD, and substance abuse of meth. Based on this, Cheyenne argued that her mental health led her to not caring for her baby. She didn't realize the consequences her actions could have. She did not purposely mean to hurt her baby. But again, as we've been discussing throughout this video, Cheyenne's actions showed that she didn't care about Sterling. She took care of her daughter just fine while actively ignoring Sterling. She left him alone in that room all by himself for over a week with no food and without changing him. She refused to take care of him despite that horrific smell that most likely radiated throughout the apartment. She knew Sterling was going to die and she let it happen on purpose because she cared so little for her baby boy. At the end of both Zach and Cheyenne's trials, the juries went off for deliberations after closing arguments. And in both trials, the juries came back and found that Zach Cohen and Cheyenne Harris are guilty of first-degree murder and child endangerment leading to death. Both were sentenced to life in prison for these charges. Defendant, please rise. State of Iowa versus Zachary Kane, verdict form, count one, we the jury find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Count two, we the jury find the defendant guilty of child endangerment causing the death of a child. The defendant may be seated. State of Iowa versus Cheyenne Harris, FECR 011490. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Count two, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of child endangerment causing the death of a child. Of course, both Zach and Cheyenne appealed their charges. Zach said that there wasn't enough evidence to support his charges. Meanwhile, Cheyenne was arguing that based on the evidence brought forward of her mental health issues, her defense should have argued diminished responsibility due to mental defect or substance abuse, either that or they should have claimed insanity. But her defense did not argue either of those things. Therefore, Cheyenne believes that her defense was ineffective. However, both appeals were denied. The judges who denied Cheyenne's appeal determined that Cheyenne specifically discussed not using insanity or diminished responsibility as a defense at her trial. Like at the trial, the defense specifically said that they were not arguing that and Cheyenne agreed with them. So no, Cheyenne can't just change her mind after the fact and say that she actually did want them to argue that after already saying that she didn't at her trial. So again, both appeals were denied and both are currently sitting in prison for what they did to their little baby boy. Of course, I'm happy that both of these disgusting, irresponsible monsters are behind bars. I do personally think that they killed baby Sterling on purpose. I think they cared more about drugs than they did that baby. I think they both just decided to stop caring for him and left him alone in that room to die. And let me say, this wasn't something that happened because they were so overwhelmed or too tired or whatever you want to argue. This was a decision they made every single day for 10 to 14 days straight. It's one thing to leave a baby like that for a day because you're just so overwhelmed and you don't know what to do. That definitely isn't okay, but again, that argument can be made. But for him to have sat there for almost two weeks without anyone caring for him, that is an intentional choice. They murdered their almost four-month-old baby because they are sick monsters, and I truly believe that. Obviously, Sterling deserved so much better in his life. 
I'm honestly wondering why he was even allowed to go home in the first place since he had meth in his system. I'm not sure what happened there. It wasn't stated whether Child Protective Services even got involved, but if they weren't, then I would have to say that a huge ball was dropped. It seemed like Sterling slipped through the cracks and was allowed to go home with two parents who cared more about meth and whatever else than raising their baby in a safe, loving home. I will never understand why parents would rather their child die than to just give them up to a home who will actually love them and care for them. They could have put him up for adoption if they didn't want him, but instead they took him home and neglected him to death. It's horrific, it's heartbreaking, and it never should have happened. But that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to know what you all think. Do you think it was an intentional homicide? Do you think Zach bears just as much responsibility as Cheyenne or do you believe his story that he didn't realize his son was being neglected? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.